We are gathered together and we're going to be exploring and just briefly this morning, kind of setting the scene, thinking about the Jesus model of ministry. What did it mean to, what would it mean to do youth ministry like Jesus? So everyone should have your, your, your manual um, and we're going to walk through this together over the course of the next few days. And as Dave said in the introduction, we won't have time to do everything. I mean, there is just a wealth of material in here. And we're going to be focusing on some specific areas that are uh, really useful, essential for you in your ministry, where your ministry is at right now. And we'll, we'll talk more about that after, after coffee break. Uh, but if you would like to go to page six... Page six in this, this manual. And we note, we read, he never held a public office, never wrote a book, never led an army or founded an institution. His classroom was the boat and the field. His followers were simple fishermen. Rejected and misunderstood by the majority, his ministry lasted only three and a half short years. But his impact changed the world. His impact changed the world. And at the end of his service, he said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. His life served as an example, not just in the words he taught, but in the way he went about ministry. That is why the Apostle John wrote, whoever claims to abide in him must walk as Jesus walked. And I would suggest that John's challenge does have huge implications for our lives and for our ministries. Because God calls us to be generation changers. This is the great role, responsibility, honor that we have as youth leaders. And you might think, well, I'm working with my group of students, you know, my 12 or 15 or 20, doesn't matter how many there are, doesn't matter how few there are. I'm working with my group of students. And you might think sometimes this is tough. Um, I, I don't see much fruit. I don't see much product. I don't see this achieving very much. But what I would encourage you to do is to lift your eyes and see that the work that you're doing, those Friday nights and Saturday nights and Sunday nights, those long hours that you invest in relationships and in preparation, that you pour into those students, that you teach, those studies that you lead, all of that is absolutely essential in impacting a generation. And don't think about your youth ministry in the short term. Think about the impact that youth ministry will have Think about the impact those students will have 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now. Because that's what we're involved in. Changing generations. Impacting a generation. And I believe that, that Jesus not only gives us this glorious gospel that we have in the Scriptures not only gives us the message of the gospel, he also gives us the methodology. He also gives us a strategy. He gives us a, a pattern and a plan for how we can structure our ministries as well, a model to follow. That we can do ministry like Jesus did ministry. That we can imitate Jesus, that we can learn to walk as he walked. Well, what would be some of the reasons? There's a question there in your manual. What reasons do people give for not imitating Jesus? Could you guys think of any, any suggestions for that in response to that question? That was 2,000 years ago. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that was in, that was in the ancient world. That's like 2,000 years ago. This is today. I mean... Jesus didn't have to worry about stuff like Facebook and social media and, you know, all the issues that young people and people are dealing with today. I mean, did he? Did he have to? Of course, lots of those things 
weren't in existence. The world is a very, very different place. Absolutely. But I love the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon wrote. And there's a phrase in Ecclesiastes that Solomon uses time and time again. And he talks about, you know, generations come, generations go. There's nothing new under the sun. When it gets right down to it, people are people. And the stuff of the heart is just the same. So yeah, there's a lot of changes, but there's a lot that's still the same, isn't it? People still desperately need God. They desperately need forgiveness. The Scriptures say that they're lost without hope and without Christ in the world. And wouldn't you agree that that's the case with many of our, many of our students in many of our cities and many of our nations? It was the same in Jesus' time. It's the same for us today. There's a lot has changed, but there's a lot. I guess the real things, the real needs are just the same. It's a great one. Any other suggestions as to why excuses maybe we might give for, for not imitating Jesus? It's not modern. It's not modern. Let's tease that out a little bit. When we say it's not modern, what are we, what are we thinking? What are we getting at? It's out of fashion. It's out of fashion. Old-fashioned. Yeah, that idea that this is old-fashioned. It's, it's maybe it's not new. It's not trendy. It's maybe not hip or cool. Um, I have a little phrase that I like to use um, in my ministry. And when I train leaders back home, it's that, truthfully, Jesus is still so far ahead of us that we haven't caught up with Him yet. Um, Jesus' ministry was pioneering. It was groundbreaking. It changed the world. Just think about it for a moment. But here He is in... in in the Middle East and Israel, in a really small geographical area, and he picks 12, 12 people. Think about it this way. Jesus had a youth group of 12 people. 11 of them had no clue what he was trying to say most of the time, and one of them wanted to kill him. I mean, it doesn't sound like a really great group, um, but that's what Jesus started with. That's what Jesus started with. Be encouraged. And look what He did with the twelve. He invested in a few. Poured His life into a few. Multiplied. Reproduced Himself in these individuals who went out and changed the world. And that's why we're sitting here at ELF today. It impacted generations. It changed the world. And yeah, it might seem, that doesn't sound very trendy. It doesn't sound very hip. It doesn't sound very cool or new to think about the Jesus model of ministry. But it's timeless in its principles. And as we learn from Jesus, as we sit at the feet of Jesus, as we look at what Jesus did, as well as listen to what Jesus said, we get the compass, we get the direction for our ministries. That they might be fruitful. uh, And that they might impact generations. I think in youth ministry, I've been doing youth ministry in... um, Ireland, Northern Ireland, for, for 22, 23 years. And uh, I've worked in, in a number of churches over that period of time. Um, just to give you a little biographical information on me, right now I, my role is, is kind of twofold. I work training and equipping youth workers and youth leaders. And I also work with a Christian charity called ASET, AIDS Care Education and Training. It may also operate in some of your countries as well, working with at-risk young people and teaching them around sexual health issues and drug use and misuse. Um, So my life is kind of focused on those kind of two areas, the mission field in a sense, and those who are 
impacting, serving as youth workers in that mission field. Um, and when I got a hold of these principles, um, when I got a hold of, of youth ministry rooted in the life of Christ, it changed everything for me. Because one of the trends I think we find in youth ministry is that we're constantly looking for the latest, the latest thing, the latest idea, the latest concept, the latest model, the latest resource, the latest curriculum. And I'm going to tell you something which I discovered, thankfully, early in my ministry, is that there's no such thing as the magic curriculum. There's no such thing as like the latest, greatest model. Um, if we want something which is enduring and something which lasts, that's got to be rooted in the Scripture. It's got to be rooted in the Word of God. It's got to have foundations that go deep. And we can look to no one better than Jesus for that. So, yeah, for sure. It might not be, it might sound, not sound, might sound old-fashioned, but actually, Jesus is so far ahead of us. Um, it's groundbreaking. And we can grab those principles and apply them in our ministries, it will be transforming, life transforming for our students and for ourselves as well. As, as a young youth leader, um, one of the things that, that I discovered as I, as I studied, as I learned youth ministry in the life of Christ, um, it wasn't necessarily that it made me a better youth leader. That I became a much better youth leader. No, what it did for me is that it made me fall more in love with Jesus. And let me say this to you, brothers and sisters, the greatest thing that you can do for your young people, for your students, is that you love Jesus more. That's the greatest thing you can do for them. Because it's out of that being with Jesus that your doing, that your ministry, that your activity will flow. So I think it's a great opportunity that we have to, as it were, sit at the feet of Jesus and to think about how He did ministry and the principles, the strategy um, that we can learn from Him. So we're going to be we're going to be doing that together, um, thinking about Jesus, thinking about our ministries, and then seeking to apply that to walk as He. Walked And those three circles that you see there in page six, uh, we're going to keep um, in view as we travel through this together. Um, so if you go to page seven, you'll see it says, there's a heading there, your ministry. What is one challenge you have right now in the ministry you're leading? What's one challenge with a person you're discipling? What is one challenge in your personal leadership or fruitfulness? I would love for you to take a moment and reflect on and answer those questions. Maybe just make some notes there in, in your manual. Um, think about those three, three questions, those three challenges. And as you think about those challenges, what are some of the emotions that you feel? What are some of the emotions that come up and, in your life when you, when you think about those things. I mean, I wish we had time to discuss this and dig a little deeper into this, but um, I'm sure as we think about these challenges, some of the emotions we might be feeling might be frustration, uh, might be fear, maybe. Um, maybe we're excited. We're thrilled at the prospect of facing some of those challenges. Um, Maybe we're maybe a little anxious. Maybe we're worried about some of those areas. Uh, maybe we feel a little bit lost when it comes to some of these challenges. What to do? Last summer, um, I was with my family. I've got um, three girls at home. My, 12, 9, and my youngest daughter is, is almost 3. She'll be 3 um, in, in two months' time. And we had a family vacation time in the west of Ireland. And uh, I'm going to do a little advertisement for Ireland here because if you've never been, you really should come. It's really nice. 
Uh, we were over in the west of Ireland and uh, having some fun, spending some time together. We were trying to find this little cottage that we were staying in. And I had never been in the west of Ireland um, in this area before. So I went online and I kind of I kind of got a rough idea. I Google mapped it. I thought, I know where I'm going. And I started on that journey, and I had a little sat-nav. Um, but one thing I discovered very, very quickly is that um, my sat-nav maps were outdated. Um, and there were new roads. There were new places. There were new routes, new routes that had been, had been um, built and established since my satnav had been sold. And it wasn't long before I was lost. I had a kind of a rough idea where I wanted to be, but I really didn't know how to get there. And what I had to do was I had to update my maps. I had to go online, I had to get an accurate strategy, an accurate plan so that I could know the way to go. I think as we, as, we look at, as we think about the challenges that you're facing right now in your ministry, what kind of sat-nav are you using? Are your maps a little outdated? Um, or are you completely mapless? Well, here we are, and looking at the ministry of Jesus, the model of Jesus, gives us that sat-nav. It gives us that map that we need to face those challenges. And I think... What would happen if we had that good map to follow is that we would see our ministry through God's eyes. We would know how to respond to some of those challenges as Jesus would. And we would see those next steps to take in our ministry to get our ministry and to get our young people to the next level. So that's what we're going to look at um, together. So if you turn over to page 8, we're going to very, very quickly in the next 10 minutes that we've left, think a little bit about our mission. Our destination, in a sense. What are we doing? And there are some scriptures that we're going to look at. The first is John chapter 15, verse 8. What mission did Jesus leave for his disciples? John 15, verse 8. By this it, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. John 15, verse 8 is very clear. Our mission as disciples is fruitfulness. We are to be fruitful. That fruitfulness is an indication of our authenticity of disciples. Jesus talks a lot about bearing fruit. If you look at John 15, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You. And when we think about fruitfulness, for sure, I'm thinking about that personal fruitfulness, uh, the fruit of the Spirit that we want to see developed in our lives, that evidence of maturity and deepening on our faith and our relationship with God. That's part of it. We want to see that in our own lives, and we also want to see that in the lives of the students that we are working with. We want to see fruitfulness, and we want to see fruit that endures. Fruit that lasts. Fruit that lasts. Fruit that makes an impact. I think about, uh, when I think about this, I think about, in my ministry, one of my young people, Michael. Michael, as a teenager, um, came to youth group, and he was really interested, and he became a believer. He followed Jesus. And uh, he started coming to a discipleship group, poured into his life. And I had the, the privilege of, of investing in Michael and seeing him grow and seeing him change. 
And seeing him go on mission to the Czech Republic year after year after year. And then to see God's call in his life, calling him to be a youth pastor. He just finished his, his youth ministry degree. And he just graduates, graduated this summer. In fact, he left early so that he could go be an intern with JV in the Czech Republic this summer. And I look at Michael, and Michael's an example of fruit that lasts, of fruit that endures. And that's what we're longing for in our young people, that they're going to come to Christ, they're going to know Jesus, and they're going to grow in their relationship with Jesus, and they're going to show Jesus to the world. They're going to know, grow, and show. And that's fruitfulness, in a sense. So we're called to be fruitful, individually, personally, and also in terms of our ministries. And then Matthew 28, we have what's very often referred to um, as the Great Commission. What's the purpose of youth ministry? To fulfill this Great Commission. If we think about the Great Commission, it really is a summation statement of how Jesus lived his life. Here at the end of Jesus' public ministry, he gathers his followers together in an appointed place, and he gives them what we sometimes refer to as, we often refer to as the Great Commission. In our Bibles, that's the title that's been put in there for this. Um, and yes, it is a great commission in its scope and in its scale. But I think sometimes we look at the great commission and we, we can very easily think, boy, that just seems so big. That's so great. It must only be for great people. It must only be for gifted people. Accomplished people. People who've been to Elf, you know? Um, it must be for great people. And when Jesus gave the Great Commission, His original intent was that it would be an everyday commission. That this would be something that marks the lives of His disciples, His followers. That this would be what they would be about every day of their lives. It was an everyday commission. As they would go about their lives, they would be involved in this fruitful work that we come to know of as the Great Commission. It's not just for great people. Well, what is it? Well, Jesus says these words in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them, that's the 11 disciples, and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So the command that we find here is make disciples. And there's two commands in the Great Commission, but um, it starts with this command to make disciples. But I don't want you to jump right in there and go, okay, let's think about disciples. Don't miss the first piece. Jesus says, all authority is given to me. That's really important that we, that we, we start there. Uh, because this is Jesus' mission. This is Jesus' mission. We want to walk as Jesus walked. We want to imitate Jesus. We want to do what Jesus did. But we have to understand, we're not Jesus. We're not Jesus. We can't be Jesus. We can follow Jesus. We can walk as Jesus walked. But this is His mission. And He graciously partners with us. Involves us in His mission in the world. All authority is given to me. Therefore go. That's really important because when you go and when you step into relationships and when you lead in your ministries and when you seek to impact your community... Often we are paralyzed by fear. Often we are paralyzed by the sense of, this seems so vast and I seem so small. I don't have what it takes. And that can paralyze us. And Jesus comes and Jesus says, all authority is mine. In other words, I'm sending you in my name to represent me. 
you represent me, it's in my authority that you seek to impact your community. It's in my authority that you seek to impact the students in the local school. It's in my authority and in my name that you seek to impact those students that you pour your life into week after week after week. Um, it's not about you or it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. Alright? So it's His authority. And then He says, make disciples. That's the first command. Make disciples. What is a disciple? If you're going to define, describe what a disciple is, what is a disciple? Someone who learns. Excellent. Some, so who follows and who, be, who obeys. So someone who learns, someone who follows and who obeys. Any other suggestions? Trained in the discipline. The sense of training. And you use another word discipline there as well. That comes into that also. We think about an a, 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 a disciple. Another word that we could um, use is apprentice. Someone who is trained in a discipline. We think about someone who's learning to be an apprentice carpenter or an apprentice uh, bricklayer or builder. They go and they learn that discipline from someone else so that they can do what that teacher does. So as we think about a disciple, it's all of that. It's someone who's a student, someone who's learning, someone who's following their leader, their rabbi, Jesus, so that they can do what Jesus did, so they can walk as Jesus walked. That is our goal. That's what we are involved in. That is our mission. Make disciples. Make disciples. And, well, how do we do that? Well, I think Jesus gives us a, Jesus gives us a pattern for doing that. And I'm going to finish with this because time's up. Um, but I, I don't want to leave it here because we've got to nail these last aspects of the Great Commission because um, there are three verb forms that we find in the Great Commission. Three, in a sense, actions. Action words, verbs. The first is going. Jesus says, as you are going about your life, make disciples. Make disciples. As you're going about your life, as people cross the path of your life, make disciples of them. That means we have to be intentional, and that means we have to be deliberate as it when it comes to making disciples. Sharing the gospel. Aggressively reaching out, intentionally reaching out to the lost. Um, and that means we've got to go where they are. Because they're not always necessarily going to come to us. I was researching um, the United States Life Saving Service a few years ago. And you might be thinking, what are you talking about, Paul? But stay with me. The United States Life Saving Service started in the, the mid-1800s in America. And uh, what really got me interested in, in the United States Life Saving Service was their motto. They have a wonderful motto. Their motto is this, you have to go out, you don't have to come back. You have to go out, you don't have to come back. What an amazing motto. And it's actually, in, in some ways, a picture of the mission of the church. We have to go out. And there's great stories of bravery in the United States Life Saving Service. Um, on the coast of Carolina, uh, where there's these outer banks, ships used to go aground and... Um, my, huge wrecks and stories told of men who would man these brave life these life saving stations these brave men who would go out into the surf in these surf boats to rescue sailors who were perishing. And there's a story told in 1863 the wreck, the wreck of a ship called the Laura Brines and nine men stood on the beach and they made a verbal will with the one guy who would stay behind. And for the next 23 hours, they went back and forth in these boats to rescue sailors who were drowning. And do you know what? In all the years of the United States Life Saving Service, no one has ever come up to the door of a life saving station 
I knocked on the door and said, hey, can you help me? I'm struggling out here in the sea. It's never happened. You have to go out. And in a sense, we have to go out to where they are. Where they're perishing and reach them. We've got to go. Um, and then we've got to baptize. Baptize is identifying with Jesus. The wonderful thing is in, in, in Jesus' baptism, He identifies with us, with our humanity, with us. And in our baptism, as we follow Jesus, we identify with Him, with His person, with His, with his message, with His mission in the world. But baptism is much more than the, the act of sprinkling, pouring, dunking, whatever your preferred option is. Um, it's about identifying with Jesus. It's about identifying, it's about being built up in the life of Jesus. And the last aspect then is teaching them to obey. Equipping people so that they can go and do what Jesus did. So they can go win people. So they can build people up in their relationship with Jesus. And just in case we're thinking, this is a huge task and I don't have what it takes, Jesus reminds us at the end of His Great Commission, behold, and that's the, the second command we have there. Um, behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I'm sending you in my name, it's in my authority that you go, and behold, I'm with you to the very end of the age. The one who sends you, who calls you, is the one who backs you, the one who's with you, the one who, we say, has your back. Um, you're not on your own. He assures you of his presence with you in that work. And it's this great commission that I would suggest gives us our pattern for ministry. Our pattern for establishing our youth ministry rooted in the life of Jesus because this sums up how Jesus lived his life. As he won people, as he built them up in their relationship with him, with God, as they identified with him, and as he sent them out to impact the nations. And this is our blueprint for youth ministry. That's just the beginning of the Jesus model.